Squid Game is a two and a half hour movie stretched out to nine hours of emotional roller coasters and has taken the world by storm. With Halloween coming up and the fact that we haven't had a good battle royale in a while, Squid Game is a welcome addition to humble minds around the world. The show is a survival thriller and is part of an effort to spread awareness of Korean culture. And you've got to say mission accomplished on that one. The series is full of intriguing moments and interesting cultural insights, but more importantly, it is extremely marketable. With a disproportionate amount of memes floating around, strangely glowing reviews and with season 2 undoubtedly in the works already, Squid Game is here to stay. The show is, however, as you may have guessed from the title of this video, very, very flawed. In fact, it's a damn shame considering the fine concept they have on their hands. And in order to fully appreciate a show, we need to take it for what it is. You've probably seen all the reasons as to what makes this show great, and my job is to provide the nuance. Despite its brutally honest exploration of human nature and culturally engaging ways, upon closer inspection, Squid Game is a narrative disaster. I might just be the only YouTuber that hasn't been paid off in Netflix's marketing efforts to hype up this show to be something it's not. I won't even go into cultural aspects like the generic characters, the squid shape on the ground not looking at all like a squid, the theatrical acting mixed with realistic acting, or the predictable on-the-nose storytelling. No, this video is about the inconsistencies introduced by the show itself. So like, comment, subscribe and strap in because here we go! First off, in the red light green light game, perfectly still people are shot whilst others who move are spared. The police are skeptical when reports of the Squid Game come in. If people have been regularly taken to the game since 1989 and are sometimes allowed to leave, either through voting or winning, there should have been lots of reports by now and winners with inexplicably fat bank accounts. A full-blown police investigation really ought to be underway at this point. The frontman, the manager of a deeply criminal organization, has not only forgotten something so basic as paying rent, but has also left a card connecting him to the Squid Games in his apartment, which will be accessed by others when he doesn't pay rent. Gyun goes back on his police report when the policeman Jono is actually prepared to take him seriously. And this is before he's even decided to rejoin the competition. And while the old man does plant the idea of rejoining, Gyun is shocked and appalled by the idea, and there is no other event after that showing Gyun changing his mind. Saibyuk being able to stay awake in the car simply by putting her jacket in front of her mouth. Also, that happening had no impact on the story anyway. When arriving at the ferry, instead of simply calling the Coast Guard, the policeman starts a solo investigation, infiltrating something he has no clue about without so much as letting his colleagues know where he's going. He then commits murder before even knowing what the supposed bad guys are up to. And nobody notices him sneaking around, entering a car, fighting in the car, changing clothes or dumping his murdered victim in the water. With more than 30 years of experience, there is still no routine in place to allow the hundreds of players to use a bathroom. Saibyuk, whose biggest character trait thus far is not trusting anyone, trusts the hysterical Minyo to not rat her out while she sneaks around in the ventilation system, and the guard completely buying into Minyo's awkwardly blatant act of stalling while in the bathroom. In the end, Saibyuk sneaking around didn't actually lead to anything. No advantages, no consequences to her or anyone else whatsoever. After the guard who was forced to show his face was killed by the frontman right in front of the other employees, the policeman steals and uses his mask without anyone wondering how their murdered supervisor came back from the dead. Without it being implied by the organization, the players assume that killing each other will gain them an advantage, and a surprising amount of them do just that. For all they know, surviving until the end will allow any survivors to share the prize money. The tug of war, where the main characters conveniently team up with each other to play against completely unknown ones, removing any doubts surrounding who could possibly win the event. The high-tech, deeply criminal organization keeps their incriminating archive in a relatively accessible place. These guys need to go paperless already. The policeman is about to get found out by the rogue employees, but because the doctor shouts for peace and quiet, they all conveniently forget about the imposter in their midst. 
The rules of the marbles game has no mention of what happens if a game is undecided when the time is up. Presumably both players die, but it could do with some clarification. Surprisingly, no player asks the given question. Then there's this employee firing an automatic rifle at a player when his colleague is standing right behind the target. Perhaps something is lost in translation here, but the rules of the marbles game state that players must acquire their opponent's marbles by playing a game of their choosing. However, Sango acquires Ali's marbles outside of the game they chose to play, which is not in accordance with the rules, but the guard lets him off the hook anyway. Ugh, then there's this whole thing about the man who played against and lost his wife in the marbles game. It would have made the most sense to choose to die together rather than let one win and then later kill themselves anyway. But okay, it's a difficult spot to be in, but he could have just played on to win the whole competition and used the money for whatever they were prepared to risk both their lives over in the first place. Surely they must have considered a scenario where one of them perishes. Then he starts blaming the other contestants for continuing the games, simply because he lost someone he cares about. He knew exactly what he and his wife were getting themselves back into when they rejoined the games. And where was he after people got killed in the previous games anyway? It would have made more sense to just jump to the part where he kills himself. The VIPs arrived long after the games had started, watching only the last two events. No reason is given as to why they, after staking so much money on the event, wouldn't want or be allowed to enjoy the full show. One of the VIPs exclaims, kill me, in response to something funny when surely it's supposed to be, you're killing me. <laughs> oh jeez, you killed me. The glass bridge could have easily been crossed by stepping on the supporting metal beams. Apart from that, no contestant tries the obvious tactic of sitting down and smashing their feet against the next glass pane to check it before jumping onto it. Moving the little glass horses to illustrate the player's progression serves no practical purpose. They didn't remove the diving kits of the rogue employees, despite not knowing whether there might still be some among them, as well as knowing for certain there was an intruder lurking about. After making it to the mainland, the policeman sees the enemies coming towards him, but doesn't run because he's on the phone. The frontman breaks one of his most important rules by showing his face right in front of his colleagues. Remember, he shot someone for this exact offense. And okay, it's his brother, but the employees don't know that. And it doesn't lead to anything productive from the organization's point of view, so the PlayStation guys should at least be conflicted about this. Also, we never get to see his face before the dramatic reveal, so when the frontman finally takes his mask off, we don't know who the hell he is before the policeman actually utters, oh. Oh, Bonus error. They even chose to not show the brother's face when the policeman found his file in the squid archives, actively preventing the face reveal from having its intended effect. Oh, geez. Finally, the policeman is shot in what could be interpreted as either the shoulder or the heart and falls to what could be interpreted as either his death or straight to the safety of water. The point is that it's left unresolved and most likely he will make a cheap return in season 2 to the surprise of f***ing no one. Gion says that he would use the prize money to buy his mother a better shop to work in, when you would think that being financially independent ought to mean that she shouldn't have to work another day in her diabetes-ridden life. Gion even complained about her working too much in the first episode. Gion then denounces Sangu for being a murderous psychopath for sacrificing others to his own benefit, and moments later tries to sacrifice Sangu for his own benefit. Also, they miss the opportunity to have Sango only pretend to be asleep and then wake up to teach Gion a lesson. This would have been more dramatic and in line with both their characters. And when Sango kills Saibyuk, the employees stop Gion from retaliating after having just allowed Sango to kill Saibyuk. They were the ones to arm the players with knives in the first place, and going back on that all of a sudden without explanation is very confusing. The competition is called the Squid Games, as revealed in the Squid Archive. But the VIPs seem to have never heard that name before when the last game is presented. Squid Game. What an odd name. Like, which is it? Are the VIPs familiar with the term Squid Game or not? Naturally, the Squid Game can't be the final event every time because that would be too boring for these rich guys and it would ruin the surprise if they knew what event was coming up. The employees forgot to mention the rule about attackers having to hop on one foot, but Gion does so anyway. Why did the VIPs leave their masks behind after the final? 
and how did they retain their anonymity while taking their masks off? Guillaume doesn't spend any of his prize money and instead continues to live as he always has. These two statements are simply not compatible, pick one. You see, he always spent the money he had as well as money he didn't have, so something here does not add up. Also, his daughter moving abroad was a major issue and motivation for his return to the Squid Games, but after winning, he does nothing to stop her from moving, which would have been fine had they just given a reason for this decision. Ilnam's master plan of getting in touch with Gyun is by making him buy something when he knows Gyun is not in the mood of spending. Ilnam's so-called game involving the homeless man on the street is completely pointless as it lacks any stakes and the outcome of the game is completely without consequence. Ilnam compares being poor to having all the money in the world because neither is any fun and you quickly get bored. And well, I don't know if it's just me, but this flagrant comparison just doesn't make any sense. No reason is given as to why Gion decides to change his hair, other than the obvious marketing tactic for season 2, of course. There is no apparent resolution to Gion's debt to the loan sharks. In episode 8, he even tells Saibyuk that paying off his debt is the first thing he'd do if he won the competition. Gion is allowed to spontaneously adopt a kid simply because he claims to know the kid's sister. Then he offloads the kid to his neighbor without the consent of either the kid or the orphanage. Here, Gion, you drop this. Instead of seeking out the policeman who took him seriously about his report of the Squid Games, Guillaume decides rather spontaneously to go after the organization seemingly all by himself, again without proper build-up and it would seem that this is just another cheap cliffhanger for season 2. Guillaume is presented as an opportunistic selfish loser who steals money from his mother and gambles the money away instead of spending it on his daughter's birthday. But inside the Squid Game, when the story calls for it, he's suddenly a champion of nobility and human life. For example, he goes against his cowardly, opportunistic nature when he chooses to partner up with Ilnam instead of the younger man. Then he allows the old man to sacrifice himself for him. Then he wants to kill Sangu. Then he doesn't want to kill Sangu. And when he comes out as a winner, he's overwhelmed with guilt, but not so much that he tries to help the families of the people that died, and instead he throws away his relationship with his daughter to go after the organization. The point is, there is no clear character arc with Gion. Sometimes he's a selfish bastard, and sometimes he's a self-sacrificing hero, back and forth without conclusion. And okay, people are complex, in a survival situation especially so, but there's just too much contradiction going on with his arc in particular. There's so much unnecessary fluff and meaningless conversations, and even plots, that don't lead anywhere. Like the policeman who goes through a tremendous effort just to get wiped out without having made any difference to the story whatsoever in the end and the presence of the VIPs having no impact on the story whatsoever themselves. The Squid Game organization continuously make the point that they value fairness and democracy, which from a narrative standpoint is interesting as they give the antagonists some kind of moral code for us to understand them by, but they go back on that in so many instances it makes the narrative random and pointless. In the red light green light game, perfectly still people are shot whilst others who move are spared. The fighting breaking out in the night is planned by the organization and treated as a game itself, without regulation or explanation to the players. The marbles game is unregulated and the players are allowed to cheat and steal the marbles of their opponents despite losing whatever game was agreed upon. The glass bridge is inherently unfair as it gets harder the earlier you have to play. And the glass shattering at the end also kills Cybuk despite her completing the game. The character of the frontman is left disproportionately unresolved, shamelessly leaving that to season 2, which is a big no-no from a storytelling point of view. Him working zealously for the organization might make sense, but we don't get so much as a traumatic flashback or other hints to explain why he's so willing to be a part of the organization after having been a player himself. All things considered, the biggest problem with the series is how they so shamelessly went for dramatic effect over qualitative storytelling. In true Korean fashion, the production value is top-notch with all the superficial boxes checked, but unfortunately these things do not plug the gaping holes of the narrative. Half the dialogue and tone-setting angles are literally filler in order to reach the hour mark in any given episode. 
You can tell how they desperately wanted 10 episodes, but there just wasn't enough content to water down for that last hour. There are countless events happening out of sheer convenience just to drive the story forward. Half the plot lines are left unresolved to force another season, and the pacing is so insultingly slow, you'll wish Netflix had a faster playback speed than just 1.5. But you know, aside from all this, I rather enjoyed Squid Game. It really is a shame that they didn't make the most out of this one. Uh, it took creator Wang Dong-yuk 10 years to get the screenplay produced, and you just know that season 2 won't come anywhere near the same quality in a fraction of the time it took to produce season 1. But as always, I I'd love to be proven wrong. Did you agree with what I said in this video? Did I miss something? Let me know in the comments. If you want to see more Every Era videos, subscribe to the channel, and if you feel like supporting the channel, check the link in the description. And as always, thank you for watching.